This is Daniel Warren Johnson, uh, creator, writer, and artist of the book Murder Falcon, and you are listening to Southern Fried Geekery. When a humble bard graced a ride along with Carol of Rivia, along came this song. From when the white bull fought a silver tongued devil, his army of elves. Who's the day? So, uh, the Witcher, uh, covers. Oh my God. Yeah. They've been amazing. Yeah. Did you see the one from the lead singer of Trivium? I did. And apparently they're coming out with a full album of that. Have you seen those, Matt? Oh, Oh, we got to share those with you. Yeah. They're pretty amazing. It's, uh, metal covers of, uh, throw a coin to the Witcher. (laughs) It's become kind of, well, first they came out with the club remix. And so it was the, it was the, what is the EDM, the oomch, oomch, oomch uh, club remix of that. And then the metal covers started coming out. Which makes a lot more sense because it's, you know, Norse bass. So, you know, you think metal would be involved in that. I mean, I'm fine with like an Atlantis Morissette version of it. Like, you know, let's have that one. Let's get like a good, like Kenny G soft rock, little jazz. So I want to hear the Trivium cover with the band behind them instead of acoustic Uh because it was a little slow. With the acoustic, but I want to hear it with the... It was. You know what wasn't slow? What? My New Year's Eve. <laughs> uh-huh. Did you guys have a good New Year's? Yeah, I was telling Matt I took some oil. Oh, yeah? And I thought I was okay and went to bed. Then I woke up at 2 o'clock in the morning just absolutely blasted. <laughs> <laughs> and couldn't go back with the giggles. And couldn't go back to sleep. Do you want me to leave that in? Or I don't that? care. Okay. I've got a card. Oh, that's true. You do. Yeah, you're, you're legal. Medical. I have a medical card. I keep forgetting so. that we're not in 1992 sometimes. Yeah. Um, yeah, not, not me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody that uh, listens to the show is going to care. No. Um, how? So how'd your, your New Year's Matt, go, Matt? It was nice. Yeah. It was, uh, I got, uh, a, I don't know, part-time lesbian, uncommitted lesbian, you know whatever title she went by touched my face and told me I looked tough on her way out the door of the part of the New Year's Eve party. She was, she was the token, uh, you know, woman who's way too drunk, way too early in the party. Oh, that one. Uh, never be that person. Yeah. I'm trying to two rules. To never be the time lesbian. <laughs> yeah. Never, never be the person that's drunk before everybody else. And never out drink your clients. Those are two rules to live by. Mm. That's never out drink your clients is a good one. Well, happy New Year's, everybody. We yeah. hope you all out there in Radio Land had a great New Year's. We hope you're safe. Yeah, we hope you called an Uber or a cab or got a friend to drive you home. Um, or just stayed home and drank. Or just stayed home and drank. I didn't. I went to some friend's house and I, I didn't drink too much. I had a couple beers. I did not call you at midnight and scream into the phone. You didn't, <laughs> as you have previously done with goals, <laughs> which was interesting. Um, welcome back to uh, the 2020 version of the Southern Fried Geekery podcast. As per usual, I guess, I'm Caleb Alexander McKenzie. Matt Trogdon. And I'm Craig Lance. And we're here to talk about some comics. What? Yeah, I'm excited about it. Uh, we're doing a regular comics episode I'm, for the first time in three weeks. I know. I, I, I'm making sure this happened. Like, we haven't talked about comics in a hot minute. Craig was like, no, no. Let's talk about something else. <laughs> I'm just like, mm. um, But no, hey, you know what we're doing next week, though? Not talking. Well, we're talking about comics. We're uh, talking about a lot of comics. We are. We're going to. This won't be a typical comics episode. We're going to do our favorite comics of the year 2019 episode. I'm super excited about this. Number one, because I, I love lists. I mean, I'm just a big nerd when it comes to that. But also because we have a. If you go to our Facebook page, if you go to our Twitter page, um, any of our sites, you can find this link and it will take you to a form. Uh, and we want your opinion on what your favorite comics of 2019 were. And this is completely subjective, right? Like, this is not a thing. Like, you don't have. There's no really science behind it. Did it bring you joy? You can. What was that chick's name who's like, if you don't lo- love it, throw it out? What was her? Like, 
thing was oh, on TV. Yeah, I don't know her Margaret name, Thatcher. No, no. <laughs> that's close. I uh, think hers was if you don't love it, bomb it. Yeah, right. right. <laughs> Sinking battleships in Argentina um, or something. But uh, no, you can go on there. You can tell us what your favorite books of 2019 were. And uh, we're going to talk about them on the show. That's going to be fun times, right? Like, who doesn't want that? Uh, but now, for right now, we're going to leave that link open for just a few more days. I'll probably shut it down like Wednesday, Thursday. Um, that'll give me time to go if tally. you haven't voted by now, yeah. by then, you know. Yeah, that'll give me time to go tally those votes and look at it, kind of make a list, uh, send it to you guys, figure out kind of how we're going to format it and do it. Yeah, a little, little behind-the-scenes stuff, a little show prep, a little action like that. It's fun stuff. But for now, we're just going to talk about some comics, some stuff we've read. I've been out of school uh, since sometime in the middle of December, and I've been reading a shit ton. Um, I, I think you guys are back at work now going just full bore. So uh, what have y'all been reading this week? Yeah, um, I'll go first, but before this isn't on my list, but the book Olympia. Oh, yeah. You know, I wish that that book, they would give us the covers that they have on the comics that they're reading in the book <laughs> on the covers of that comic. <laughs> Anyways, that was just a little short digression. Um, I read Detective Comics number 1018 by, of course, Detective Comics, DC. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, Peter J. Thomasy, Scott uh, Godoweski, I think is how you say his name, mm-hmm. and David Barron. Uh, I mean, this book had a murder Santa and a blood eagle, and do I really have to say much more than that about why you need to read this issue? <laughs> murder Santa. Dude, I love Scotty God, man. Scotty God's yeah. dope. That yeah, that, the art in that book was mm-hmm. phenomenal. Uh, I read Pretty Violent, number five by Image Comics. Uh, Derek Hunter, Jason Young, Spencer Holt. This book, every issue, makes me laugh out loud in it. It's about a girl that's being raised, has been raised by villains that wants to be a superhero, but she still lives with her villain family. So they're manipulating her in the background, and she fucks up every mission she goes on. Mm -hmm. She's finally been accepted to like the Justice Society, Justice League, Mm -hmm. Avengers-type team, and fucks up her first mission there. Because she had a contract with her brother that she had to lose to the next guy because he had helped her on another thing. So, yeah. it just And the way she lost that battle was by putting her fingers in a Chinese finger handcuff thing. That'll get you every time. And got every stuck time. and couldn't get out of it. So now she's a laughing stock of the hero community because she was taken out by a children's toy. But, I mean, to be fair, those things are they're tricky. They are tricky. Yeah. So, um, like I had to repeat the third grade because of one of those things. <laughs> it, it, if you've read I Hate Fairyland and you even mildly liked it, mm-hmm. you really need to be reading Pretty Deadly. Yeah. Because it, it's pretty. In, pretty violent. I'm sorry. Pretty Deadly is a different book. I think I but, made that mistake the last time we talked about the <laughs> <that> book. <laughs> uh, yeah. You really, you really need to be reading this book because it's just fantastic. Yeah. Then the other thing I read is I'm two thirds of the way through Tales of the Witcher, Sword of Destiny, which is the second book in the Witcher series. Mm -hmm. Um, I did look up how to say his name this time, so I don't, you know, totally kill it. It's Andre Sapkowski is the author on it. So, uh, very good. It's the second book. It's uh, still short stories, and then the next book starts into the novels, so I'm kind of excited to get to the novels. This one's had uh, an interesting take on Little Mermaid, Um, Because all of these stories, these short stories are based on fairy tales. Right. So he's helping this duke out that wants to marry the mermaid, but she wants him to take fins and go live with him in the water. Take fins. (laughs) And she, and he wants her to get, well, he wants, she wants him. They both have a way. (laughs) She has a way for him to grow fins and go live in the water. Mm -hmm. He has a way for her to grow legs and come live on land. I just want that to be like an official title. Yeah, it's like, no, do, do you take fins? Yeah, yes, I take fins. <laughs> I like the way Greg said it. Like everybody knew what it meant. <laughs> well, to take fins. I was getting. Well, there. wait a minute. <laughs> I was getting there. So they both have, and she's mad because she's the one making all the sacrifices. She's the one that's getting her scales rubbed off every time they have sex. Is she has is to lay not, on the raw. Is that not how it's supposed to happen? <laughs> it, it, anyway, she's like, can't he? Can't he take the? You know the. Make Take the sacrifice the for this one? Can't he make the sacrifice? And the witcher's like, but he can't breathe underwater. You can breathe in it. Anyways, it was a real interesting take on The Little Mermaid. Sounds like a problem a good snorkel could solve. Quite possibly. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, 
you know, I highly recommend these books so far. Hey, so. Did you toss a coin to your Witcher? I did not. But it had the dragon one in this one, too, that nice. was in the series. Okay, that's awesome. Yeah. Well, so I read a couple of different, like I said, I've, I've been reading like a monster. Um, I got to give a shout out to our, our buddy Arnie um, and also our buddy Jason Wood from EOC uh, for, number one, recommending and are providing some of these books. Um, there is a book called Weapon Brown that I I don't think you guys had heard of prior to this, but you damn sure have now because I went on a tech storm when I got, oh, it's all good, when I got, the, when I started reading this book. Weapon Brown by Jason Youngblood is essentially a post-apocalyptic Charlie Brown destroying everything that you hold dear about comic strips. Uh, it is it is not for the faint of heart. <laughs> it is completely unapologetic. Um, it, it involves a fair amount of titty milk <laughs> that he's hunting down. Um, Charlie Brown is a... Does it involve taking fins? It, I haven't gotten all the way through the book yet, so it might. Um, so, yeah, Charlie Brown's got, like, a robot arm, and Snoopy's just like a murder dog. And, like, the crew from Dilbert, <laughs> or the Illuminati, oh is essentially what the I way mean, that all tracks, so... Uh, it, is, it is insane and amazing, and, dude, the artwork is phenomenal. Uh, it, it's, it's and some of the pictures you sent oh, us, I would agree. So, it's so good. Um, and then there's... Uh, so, that was a fun book. It was kind of a... La- like, literally a laugh-out-loud book. And then I read another book that was more of a serious comic. It, this is Home After Dark by David Small. I actually went on our Facebook group and, like, posted some pictures of it. Uh, just so... Because it, it's not a very well-known book. At I least. saw that. Um, if, you're, if you're only reading hero books, you, you probably haven't seen this. But incredibly incredibly well crafted story it's very much about like it takes the the all american boy trope i'm putting that in quotes and uh kind of turns it on its head and puts it through like a you know a reality cheese grater yeah um, people couldn't see you doing the quote sign so i'm glad you it, podcasts are weird um <laughs> i need to figure out a way to put my fingers in the microphone maybe you know, rub hmm. the scales off um <laughs> microphone gets fins uh and then the third, fins. <laughs> the third book i read you actually already mentioned uh you got a little ahead of me on this one it's Olympia number two. Oh. Um, i love this book man uh kurt and tony pyers alex diotto uh d kunafi and micah myers on those letters um i think so you remember the toys that made us show i think they've come out with a new season on netflix but when they were talking about I forget which guy it was, but he said these these toys or these shows were toyetic. Yeah, um, that's what this book is. Like this book is toyetic. Like, yeah. it, it really does look like you're de- dealing with action figures. It's super um, meta book. Too. Yeah, it's incredibly meta, and I absolutely love it. I think it's great. Uh, if you it, haven't read this, check it out. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. I really like. I said I wish that they would do alternate covers because the the stories following comics that are you know the person the main mm-hmm. character is in the real world quote unquote real world. But his story's already been told through comics. Yeah. So you see the comics, and I want those covers as a <laughs> variant cover. Maybe that'll be an extra. Maybe they'll put Maybe. that in like the back of a trade dress or something like that, Maybe. which would be dope. That'd be yeah. really cool. It'd be a good idea for them to do. Trademark. Listen to us. You, yes. heard, you heard it here first. Yes. Yeah. What'd you read this week, Matty Matt? Well, my stack was short this week because, uh, first of all, there weren't, yeah, there weren't many books that came out, and then our local shop was shorted a few. So um, I read two Marvel books, uh, one being... Marvel's uh, X Men number four by mm-hmm. of course Jonathan Hickman, and then last name U, middle name Francis, um, Jerry <laughs> Alagu, yeah, another one, and Sonny Go. I'm just not pronouncing names today. Um, so this, of course, was good. What was kind of uh, stand out about this issue is most of it took place um, during a meeting. Mm-hmm. Uh, one of, of which uh, Apocalypse wore a suit <laughs> and it, it was uh, fascinating it's like you know where strong writing specifically comes through when you're reading about a meeting and it's very very interesting. George Lucas calls those the table scenes mm-hmm. you have to have the dinner table scene where you explain the narrative well this was not ex- so much explaining narratives it's just you know another another meeting between the two powers yeah, and gotcha. how each one of them are reacting to that. And you get some great, uh, once again, some great mag- Magneto dialogue. Yeah. It's Never the one comic that. I didn't get to this week in uh. my stack because I had a massive headache when I got Ooh. to it. And I was like, no, I'm done. That I sucks. Just, yeah. Yeah. Sorry, buddy. Yeah, yeah. It's okay. I'm all, I'm okay now. I'm all better. But apocalypse in a suit. Yeah, apocalypse in a suit. suit. And yeah. apocalypse doesn't say much during the meeting, but what he says is excellent. That, that could have not say, been call, an email. Call me, Symbol, 
He does not. Well. <laughs> also, I read uh, Marvel's Thor number one by Donny Cates, Nick Klein, and Matt Wilson. I, as I said before, I'm not necessarily a big on Thor, but I thought, well, I'll give this a shot um, out of curiosity, really. Uh, not bad. Not bad at all. I mean, it's a great first issue. The art is really good. Yeah. Really dug the art. I really, that there's a scene where Galactus shows up. And that scene specifically was done very well. Uh, so, yeah, it's a great starting off point. Um, I may pick up the second issue just to see what's going on. But, again, Thor as a character doesn't hold any – I don't hold any love for him. So sure I do. I, I do, and I'm, I'm really excited about this book, kind of in particular, because so far, as far as his Marvel work goes, like I, Donny Cates gets a lot of love for it and I completely get it because if you're interested in the properties that he's doing, then you're, you're loving it, right? Like it's, he's just doing really, really awesome stuff so far. He hasn't done anything that I'm really care. Like I don't care about venom. I don't, like it just, he did that book with Trad Moore, the silver surfer black that I got just for Trad Moore. Uh, but it, so far there just hasn't been anything piquing my interest. I agree. So now because I'm an Avengers dude, I'm really excited about getting Thor. And, and of course this was the book that I got our, you know, our shop got shorted. Yeah. Book, I so didn't get it. Either, I so. have not had this one yet. So I'm excited to hear that you liked it. Yeah. I mean, if, if you're a Thor fan, I'm assuming mm-hmm. you're going to love it. Yeah. Oh, good. Um, because I'm not a Thor fan and I liked the book. Nice. It's a great dialogue between he and uh, Loki, for example, it's just, it's strong. It's definitely good. strong. Good deal. And um, thirdly, I read Dark Horse Crone number three by Justin Greenwood, Dennis Culver, and Brad Simpson. Uh, great issue. Yeah. Nice. The story keeps moving along, keeps getting a little bit yeah. more interesting in each one. So I recommend it, definitely. So I think this is, is this a four part series? I think it is. Series? Is it going to end at four? Ooh, I don't know. Yeah. I, I was think look, it is a four part I was looking through the previews for this uh, on this upcoming section, and I saw the trade, but I didn't see the the actual like floppy. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think it ends either at four or six. I'm curious. Dark Horse usually does four issues. So yeah, it's, it's really good though. I, I've enjoyed every issue of that book so far. You read, uh, you handed me back that, uh, slain mm-hmm. trade paperback. So give me your, give me your review on that. Uh, I enjoy it. It's number one, The key thing for me on that one is the artwork. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah. So what, what Matt's referring to is the book he spoke on uh, a few episodes ago, uh, slain he'd let me borrow and i read it to me the art's a strong point you know that's the writing is not particularly uh in depth the stories aren't hard to wrap around it they're not doing anything complex in that they're just giving you dumb fun like swinging swords and kicking ass mm. books and, and to me that's fun and, and that's fine but it's kind of like reading some of the older uh conan comics which i'd love they hold a special place in my heart uh but they're you know you're, you're not doing any in-depth writing or anything in there and so it, but it, again it's just sit down and watch a I'm sure they're a big dude with an axe. Time. So well Pat Mills doesn't yeah. do like heavy multi-layered writing. Pat he, Mills doesn't have feelings. He, he, <laughs> he all his all his writing seems to be based off of anger yeah. and his punk rock <laughs> attitude. Yeah. And punk rock is not about deep seated no, multi-layered. It's about fuck you. Yeah. Here fuck you go. Man. And that's basically the way he writes. All everything I've read of you know that he does is basically a big it just feels like a big middle finger to somebody yeah <laughs> so well but one of the thing pat mills does like if you go and you look at a lot of 2000 ad stuff you're right he doesn't do the fifis but one thing he's really good at doing is like satire or turning something on its head i mean you look at judge dread and that's like judge dread is this completely fascist figure but it's also saying fuck you to fascism um, like, so, so he has that nuance there and that's not exactly in the slain book, but it's still just, like you said, it's barbarian with an ax murdering things and it's amazing. Yeah. And yeah. there is a cool the, dragon. Yeah. <laughs> so. Judge Dredd's a middle finger to fascism, mm-hmm. you know, martial law is a middle finger to superheroes. Right. And so on. Yeah. 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 And this, to me, like this didn't feel like a middle finger to the sword and sorcery type. No. It was mm-hmm. just a, it was just a straightforward, like, Oh, like, let me, let me channel some more hyperviolent Roy Thomas. Yeah. And get that going. And I love that. Like, yeah. I think that's, I think it was fun. I had a great time with it. I appreciate you letting me borrow it. Yeah. It was good stuff all around. Um, so now two out of three of us have read that book and I'm looking at you, Craig. <laughs> okay. I'll, I'll, I'll take it and read it. I've, I've been going through, I've been going through the toxic, you know, those books I told you about the, and I'm almost done because they went out of business at issue like 32. Mm-hmm. I'm on issue like 27. 
and you can feel that uh, it's yeah, coming, it's money coming has been end. tight yeah. is the way these issues are reading. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, belt, the belt is being cinched up. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. <laughs> well, so I said two out of three of us have read that book. Uh, three out of three of us have read another book. You want to talk into our, talk about our, our round table, our family meal this morning? Yeah. Yep. As we sit around the table like, like brethren. It's going to um, be interesting to see what your guys' thoughts on this book are. It will be. Yeah. It always is. Yeah. I bet we have three very unique views on this possibly let's find out yes Don't, what you know what book we're talking about i do i Don't hope you, i yeah, do or else maybe. it's gonna be really weird <laughs> three there different will, takes on three or there will books. be a lot of different takes <laughs> um so the book we are talking about and i want to issue kind of a spoiler warning for this because this is a book it's relatively newer it's not fresh off the presses because as as you both have mentioned the past two weeks being christmas and new year's it's kind of a slow week for comics there wasn't a whole lot that came and then out. our local comic book store did not get any of the new yeah. number ones in so. yeah i mean yeah full disclosure i think we were planning on doing either thor or the new star wars book but because uh, of Diamond, so it wasn't and completely not our, our local comic book shops. So no, I, I Diamond wanna, did some yeah. funky things to the um, Matt Matt yeah. is If it's any way in his power, he's going to take our money for his books. Uh, and this was completely outside of his power. So um, you know, again, if you ever shop at that place or you're in Central Arkansas, uh, check out Kapow because they're they're great. Uh, but Diamond did some funky stuff, and they so did. we're we're talking about a book that came out a few weeks ago, and that book is none other than uh, Wonder Woman: Dead Earth by uh, written and drawn by Mr. Daniel Warren Johnson, who I'm a huge fan of, and then colored by Mr. Mike Spicer with letters by Russ Wooten, which you got to imagine his name is fun to say at parties. Russ Wooten? Uh-huh. Yeah. Wooten! <laughs> I don't know why. That just stands out to me. Um, so what did you guys, what, the, the Wooten wave or something? I don't know. There's got to be a thing there. Uh, what did you guys think about this book? Just hand, thumbs up, thumbs down, thumbs up. initial thoughts? Thumbs up. Thumbs up. Yeah. yeah if, it's just, up. if it's just that point, and we'll talk about that <laughs> later. Yeah. So Asterisk. It says, yeah. says yeah, yeah. It's it's a thumbs up. Cool. Just one thumbs up, not two. It's one and three quarters. Okay. I'll give it two thumbs up. I, I really enjoyed this. So let's let's talk about it, man. Um, one of the great things about Wonder Woman, especially when it's written by like an, like as, as an Elseworld story, which, which this is, is that DC canon with Wonder Woman gives you kind of this cornucopia of origin stories to choose from. Uh, even going back... To things like you know the George Perez run, uh, one of Wonder Woman's greatest strengths is that there's always this air of myth to her mythos. Like there, like you know, she doesn't actually know where she comes from either. And I think DWJ plays this up to his strength in this book, and he opens it up with Diana in the middle of this Amazonian kind of rotunda, uh, playing on the clay floor uh, and floor. I can't speak. I've got south mouth like a bastard this morning. Um, Hippolyta is she is telling her this grand legend of how she formed Diana out of the clay, uh, you know, and breathed life into her, the, the Marston origins of it all. And, you know, but this is just word of mouth, right? Like, who knows if that's how it really went down? It's got this, again, it's this air of legend about it. And this moment's kind of cut short as this World War II biplane just comes crashing down. And at that point, Diana is introduced to, to man uh, for the first time. These, these creatures, these beings that she's only heard of in legend from her mom. But not only that, she gets her first real experience with war. Um, on Themyscira, war had just been stories up until that point for her, for Diana. Everybody else still remembered it, but she was the first child. But now it's real. And Hippolyta warns her that... You know, someday the world's unknown forces, the, the powers that be, if you will, they're going to they're going to tighten their grip on the world so much that they are going to shatter it. Uh, and lo and behold, one day they do just that war takes effect. And Daniel Warren Johnson doesn't tell us how or what happened with that. Or, you know, he doesn't tell us who kicked it off. He, you know, doesn't let you know if anybody like assassinated a foreign government figure. Uh, but long after Diana has left the island and, and entered into the world of man uh, and established herself as Wonder Woman, she's already she's been a hero somebody lets the nukes fly man somebody pushes that button and the world as we know it it's it's over it's just gone and you know there's it's this nuclear wasteland um what little society there is left has become it's just kind of like some straight up mad max shit uh there's there's little pockets of people little pockets of humanity you know you can assume that there's in multiple places um they're just kind of something that looks like modern life left, but it's it's a very loose skeleton of it. Uh, you know, these folks are just kind of scraping by to survive. And in, in this particular instance, there's this little merry band of wastelanders, uh, you know, and they're hacking their way through the bush. And it's getting late. You know, they've, they've been doing this for a hot minute. They're tired and they want to go home. But 
you know, wherever home is, who, who knows? Um, but they're empty handed. They don't have anything. They got nothing to take back and they, they can't go home empty handed. This is the fucking wasteland, man. Uh, you know, if, if you go home, if you don't hunt, you don't eat, you know, that kind of thing. And yeah, the, don't, the, don't enjoy the water because then it will no. control you. <laughs> um, <laughs> And, and the, there's a girl leading the group, and her name's D. And D reminds them that if they show up with nothing, then the guy that runs the place, this dude named Thaden, he's going to completely cut off their rations. It's like that dude in the first part of Skywalker. Like, he's only give you, like, three-quarter rations for some bullshit. Um, you know, Ray's going to be hungry. That is worth three-quarters <laughs> rations. Um, and that's in my brain. That's what I imagined him looking like until we actually saw him. Um, but, yeah, like I said, if you don't contribute, then you don't eat. And, hey, she's got they, – they all do, but she, in particular, has got people that depend on her. And so she, she's pushing her little group on. They're, they're going to hunt. They're going to do so by taking the road less traveled by. They're going to go off the map, so to speak. And, you know, let me ask you something. What, what good is a nuclear holocaust story if it doesn't if it doesn't put forward some, like, irradiated shit, uh, like, like some monsters, especially when you've got a guy like Daniel Warren Johnson uh, drawing it? You've got to have them, right? Like, you just got to. It'd be damn near egregious not to have those. And... Man, the dude doesn't disappoint at all. Um, there's a reason no one comes out where this little party where D's got her people at off the map. And one of those reasons is because there are these monsters and they're called Hadra. And they're kicking around out here and they're, they're big and ugly. And you might be asking yourself, the fuck is a Hadra? Well, I, and I said Hadra. Did you guys pronounce it a different way? Or am I saying that right? I said Hydra in my mind and then was going, this doesn't look anything like Yeah, it didn't have multiple heads. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, just kind of a single-headed creature. Well, these are some 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 big, ugly motherfuckers. They've got like a saber-toothed skull, some, you know, they're bipedal stegosaurus-looking bastards. And one just so <laughs> happens to pop up out of nowhere. Uh, and the crew has to, man, they got to beat feet. They got to run. Uh, they got to get out of there. And in doing so... This one member of the group, and his name's Tal, he's, he's, you know, just a little blip in the story. <coughs> he trips and, you know, he tumbles, he falls into a hole. Uh, and you know, the rest of the group, they kind of stop and, you know, they're doing that scratching their heads thing to see where he went. And, and they're looking down the hole, but they, they can't see him. It's, it's too dark down there. And But what they can see, <laughs> the immediate threat, is this Hadra, and he's about to eat that ass if they don't get up out of there. And, you know... I, this one guy, he does what I... the fan and eat the ass. <laughs> rub, rub the scales. Um, this one guy, I think he does what, what any of us would do, uh, self-respecting wastelanders. Uh, and he pokes it with the pointy end of a spear, um, and which is smart. It's good thinking. Uh, and they jump like hell. They they decide, like, you know, Hadra in front of us, hole in the back, like, let's go down that path. And when they jump down there, they land on something. But it's not what you might expect to land. Like, it's not like rocks and this craggy void uh, what they land on is this kind of metallic man-made looking thing and just about the time they get their bearings just about the time they stand up get their feet underneath them something just big lands on them and it's it's what you think it is it's it's the hydra or the hadra and whatever it is it, it just crumbles when they're standing on it and they fall even further into the earth and where they land is this they kind of land on this weird metal pod looking thing and you know the metal bends the glass shatters gravity does its thing as gravity is wont to do um but the group really doesn't have time to think about any of that because the hydra the thing that fell on them is there and it's a little pissed off turns out dude didn't like getting poked with a stick which i really can't blame the guy um i don't like being poked with sticks but unless you you know or one, never mind. Um, and just just when the Hadra is going to bear down on them, uh, something reaches out of the pod and grabs it by the throat. And it's Diana. It's Wonder Woman. And she's she's wearing this sort of like cryo suit. So and she's fucking Wonder Woman, right? So she just she tosses the Hadra off to the side, and then she's you know I, she's just done with the fight at that point. She looks at D and the rest of her little ragtag group, and they're like, you know what's happening where, where are we um, what was that <laughs> who was that guy um but they don't have time to answer because the hydra ain't no punk cuz he you know he comes back with a little vengeance um you know he's gotten poked with a stick smacked around the room i mean dude's having a bad day getting no respect and so you know he, he's given as good as he gets there's a heck of a fight and eventually diana has enough and she just collie maws this bastard uh just reaches in and rips its heart right out of its chest and it was freaking amazing. Um, Diana takes a minute to you know kind of catch her breath. She, she's starting to look around, and the room that they're in it's it's part cave, but it's it's part something else. It, like I said, there was they landed on this little metal sphere with glass and stuff. Part of it looks like a living quarters. It might be a laboratory. There's like a computer lab, um, and over in the corner there's a sofa, and on said sofa, lounging about, taking up space, is this kind of half naked skeleton 
you know, doing nothing for nobody. Uh, he, dude's dead. And as she gets closer to it, she realizes that what it is, it's, it's this kind of tattered costume. And then it dawns on her and she realizes what she's looking at. And, and a single name passes her lips. And that name is Bruce. And yeah, that skeleton, that thing just wasted away on the couch is Batman. And at one point in time, it was Batman, but now they're in what's left of the Bat Cave, and and most of it's blown out, right? Like this is this again nuclear holocaust to shattered some windows and shit. And as she looks outside at all these impact craters, that she starts she starts to remember like what happened, um, like this is this is this is where she was when it, when it all went down. And she starts to realize things like where her wonder woman suit was, where her sword is. Uh, and she goes about collecting her items, uh, you know, and for good measure, just because why not? He's not using it. She takes Batman's utility belt off <laughs> and she just goes ahead and throws that on too. Um, I mean, again, that's what I would do. There's no point in, she's now one of that woman. Yeah. Um, <laughs> she, she's collected two of the three Trinity items, um, <laughs> point, points, points all around. Um, and, and there's no point in sticking around here, right? Like, there's nothing in this bat cave for her. So she tells D and them that, you know, she's like, I'm going to go with you guys. You look fun. There was a monster guy. I got to rip his heart out. Um, and she's going to join them and go back to wherever they're staying, go back to home. Which, by the way, home for these people is this kind of a medieval castle-looking place. Um, and they, they, they go and they get there, but, but some shenanigans happen, guys. Like, right before they get up there, I don't know, like... D turns around and stabs Diana in the neck with a tranquilizer. Like some betrayal happens. Um, inevitable betrayal, if you will. And remember, they they can't go back empty handed. This this castle, the place where they're, they're staying, this home is, is ran by exactly the kind of guy that you think would run a, a wasteland castle. He's, he's nasty. He rules with an iron fist. He even keeps a harem, uh, which the whole point and what they're planning on doing is D and the crew are going to trade Diana to his harem, to his collection of women for extra food. And it might have worked, too, except for the fact that Diana's an Amazonian. And, you know, the trank is probably well past its expiration date. Uh, you know, these people don't exactly have a lot of science happening here. Um, she wakes up right in the middle of the trade-off. And she just starts wrecking shop. Like, she's kicking over tables, whipping all kinds of butt. And the the problem is is the numbers are against her. And the next thing you know, these these dudes are holding her down. And, you know, just pow, big old fist right to the face. This big guy just knocks her lights out. Um, and a little later, she wakes up and she's in a cell. But, you know, hey, Dee's plan didn't work out so great for her because Dee's in the cell next to her. Apparently, homeboy that runs the place wasn't so much appreciative that they brought in, uh, they brought him this somebody who was going to, like, trash his house. Um, and, you know, speaking of being unappreciative, Dee kind of figures out that Diana probably isn't too happy about being knocked out and sold into slavery. <laughs> um, I mean, I wouldn't be. But, look, this is Diana, and Diana's nothing, nothing if not the embodiment of love. And even when it's not convenient, and that's the whole point. And so... Even in the face of betrayal, she understands the position that D was in and she forgives her. And, you know, Diana shows this woman unconditional love, probably for the very first time in her life. Uh, you know, this obviously this woman's been living a, you know, really hard existence. And so as the two women are sitting there talking, um, you know, th they hear some voices coming down the hall and it's the, the guards and the guards are coming to take Diana to the pit, um, which is exactly what you think it, it might be uh, with a name like the pit. Um, I wonder if they have a sign. I hope they have a sign. I want them to have, I want them to have a sign. Um, it's a gladiatorial arena where Diana has been sentenced to fight. I get the feeling none of these people know how to write anymore, though. I want like, there, somebody out there does. They they have to have a sign. <laughs> they deserve one. Um, and so Diana's got to fight in the pit, man. She's, you know, fight to the death against all these beasts, these big nasties. I mean, we've already seen things like the Hadra that, you know, and Thaden's keeping them for just kind of this brutal entertainment. Um, again, very Mad Max like. And the, the guards toss Diana out into the arena and they release the deadliest fiercest monstrosity in, in Thaden's collection. I mean, this is like the gold standard of you're going to die. Um, and it's, it's cheetah like, yeah, that cheetah, uh, you know, from, from wonder woman, except she's got an upgrade. She, I, I, is it though? <laughs> um, <laughs> maybe, uh, she's, she's deformed. She's been mutated by the irradiation. I'm assuming, uh, you know, she, she's got a fucking cheetah head for a hand. Like she's no more thumbs. Like I said, an, up, an upgrade. It reminds me of those Transformers, like from the Beast Wars you would get, and like the eagle, the head would actually be the arm, and just like, um, as, you, as you're fighting. Ultron-esque, bunch of yeah, um, lions put together. 
And dude, she's she's bloodthirsty. She's mad. She there, there's not a lot of Barbara left in there. Um, and she goes after Diana. It's like it's the one thing that she can do. Um, and Diana at this point doesn't have the luxury of her weapons. She's just kind of bare knuckle on her way through this. Well, while all this is going down, um, the fights you know it's getting good in the arena. You know, people are cheering. These guards who are watching the wall, you know, they're they're not getting to hang out at the party. They got to work, you know, pay the bills and shit. And they, they see these creatures, these little red dog, like things, man, they're hoofing it. They're charging towards the castle wall and there's a ton of them. And you remember that scene from world war Z? It's kind of like that. It's (laughs) these guys are completely not ready and they start popping off arrows, but there's just too many of them. They're going to get ran over. And back in the arena, Diana is kind of starting to break through to Barbara. Her humanity, which has been buried there after years of abuse, um, is starting to connect. She's starting to recognize who, who's in the ring with her. Um, but right at that moment, that, that pivotal moment, these monsters, these mutated things, they just kind of spill over into the stadium, and it just creates chaos. It's every man for themselves. Um, it's absolute carnage. I mean, Diana's kicking dogs she's jumping over bodies and dodging spears she's she lost sight at cheetah at one point but what she does see is she sees d her, her little buddy d um about to get bitten half by one of these dog things and she jumps in at the last minute and saves her i mean it's just a bloodbath but you know once again game of numbers pays off there's a lot of people here and finally finally after you know sweat blood and tears the the last of these dog beast things get put down and the soldiers are, at this point, they're in awe of Diana, her skill, her prowess, um, her, her ability to lead on a battlefield. So they start chanting her name, like this is this is her comeuppance. Um, but it gets interrupted by a scream, this blood-curdling, just bitch scream. <laughs> and it's Thaden, <laughs> and he is not having a good day, because he is getting chased by Cheetah. Um, <laughs> she went after the dude that's been holding her prisoner, and she's about to kill the shit out of him. And... Look, it's Diana, though. She can't. Which is worse than just killing him. Yeah, right. You bite it and, like, shit squirts out. That's, <laughs> that's how you kill the shit out of somebody. Um, there's, there's been too much bloodshed. Diana can't, she can't watch somebody, even somebody who deserves it, um, be killed. Um, and so she stops the cheetah. She steps in, and, and she just stops everyone. She, she's in complete control of the city at this point. And she tells them, hey, this is enough. You don't have to live like this. There, there's a place. Um the place that I come from and it ha- it's un- it's untouched. It's gotta be like, there's some place we can go. Um, I call it home and, and we're going to go there. And of course she's talking about the mascara, right? Like she's gotta be. And that's the end of the chapter one. And I like, this is the, it's a black label book. I imagine it's going to be a two part series. I imagine we're going to get one more of these things. It's going to be action packed as shit. Just like this one. I cannot wait to see what he does with it. But Kind of, kind of cool seeing Mad Max Wasteland come to Themyscira, which is what I think we're gonna have. So I'm, I'm Craig. You mentioned that we're bound to have multiple, like, come from different places on this. I would love for it if you would kick off this part of the conversation. Okay. Yeah. So one thing I want to talk about that I really loved about this mm-hmm. book is something that was very subtle. But you mentioned her origin being from the clay mm-hmm. and the dirt, and that she gets her power from that. And then you have this nuclear wasteland, and she mentions many times throughout this book that she's weaker now. Yeah. Because the dirt has been soiled by the nuclear Mm -hmm. holocaust. So that, I thought, was a really cool nod to her origins. Yeah. Well, not only that, too, but also... Just being unconscious for, you know, two generations. Well, not that, too, but you think about her origins and the multiple things there. There is a figure who is pivotal to Diana's being... uh, and that's, of course, Ares. That's not mentioned. They're not naming right. the character. But this whole thing is about war. <clears throat> right. Like, like Ares' thumbprint is is all over this right. book. He's an antagonist. He just isn't named. And I think that's genius right. on DWJ, point, his part. I absolutely so. love this story. Um, love everything about this story. Mm-hmm. The art, to me, um, is very DWJ, which is what I expected. Right. Um, but Diana, a lot of times, didn't feel like Diana to me. And, and that's really my solid, my one complaint with this book is, uh, she so? just she didn't look like her. She, and it's a very you know, it, it's fine. It's his, it's his style, mm-hmm. and, and I'll live with it, and I like it. But, um, so, and if I'm I'm wrong, step in. To me, the figure as Diana, like like you said, it's not it's not the same Diana look that we would get in the mainstream. Um, this did look like a younger version of Diana. This looked to be like, as far as um, 
she didn't have the stature. She wasn't seven feet tall. She's not bulked out. Mm-hmm. Um, she she did look to me like a kind of I'd say eighteen or nineteen she, year old young girl. She doesn't look Amazonian. Uh, yeah, to me. she looks. I, yeah, I think that's a fair. I think that's a fair point because I noticed that as well. I didn't. Yeah. It didn't take anything away for me, but. Yeah, it wasn't what we saw. But again, like you said, part of that might have been her diminished power uh, and, and <clears throat> Maybe. disconnect from I the I mean, Earth. it very well may have been, but yeah. she was still an Amazon by mm-hmm. birth. So um, I don't, uh, he definitely, you know, I, the term house style is usually reserved for Marvel. Right. But still, when you, when you read a book about the Trinity, let's say, mm-hmm. you expect to be able to recognize who they are. And, you know, that that was probably my real only complaint with this book, yeah, to her, be honest. Her design didn't have the stature, maybe. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, I'm not talking about big breast and no. dress scantily and all of that. I'm just talking about... Oh, you're talking about the Jose, you know, Jose Luis Garcia Lopez. Because DC had their own house style, too. I mean, Lopez yeah. literally drew the book on it. Right. Um, and she didn't have that. You're right. She wasn't that big, uh, like... And it's okay that she's she can be skinny mm-hmm. or what, but she should look like an Amazon. Yeah. Um. You know, but that's okay. It's okay. The story was great. Mm-hmm. You know. So I mean, I can I can certainly let something like that slide. And uh, as the story went on, I felt like she looked more and more like Diana. So maybe it had to do with with just waking up from being in this self induced yeah coma or Bruce induced coma she was in or whatever you know. So, um, it'll be interesting to see, you know, where's Superman in this? Right. Did the nuclear holocaust kill Superman? Because I can't imagine that you can't address that in the story somehow. I imagine that's going to be coming in the, the second. Because I was, again, I made that joke about you've collected two out of the three Trinity coins. Right. Um, I think that they've got to put that in there, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, I think it's a it's a question that bears some, you know, May, and maybe not. Maybe they just ignore it and mm-hmm. we just assume Superman's dead. But it'd be interesting to see how DWJ thinks that he would yeah. survive in a nuclear holocaust. I'm, I'd, I'd what if it. he survived the the fallout where you have the, the sun is blocked out from the earth? Oh, yeah. With You know, what if it weakened him enough that he didn't survive? At Craig that and his holocaust science over here. <laughs> I mean, no, I mean, that's true. You black out the sun... That's it game over. Yeah. yeah. I mean, now granted, maybe he could have flown through it into the, into space to get. Yeah. So, you know, so, I mean, it'll be interesting to see if they even address that, but, uh, and maybe I'm wrong. Maybe we all have similar opinions of this book. I don't know. So the art in this book was obviously the standout mm-hmm. for me. I'd say, obviously, um, it was hella fun to look at. It is. I mean, it was very dynamic. Um, it was interesting that the colors are so vibrant, but still it feels very desolate and, you know. Yeah, for so sure. So that was an interesting yeah. feeling looking at that. <clears throat> you know, it feels grayscale, but it doesn't look grayscale. Right. I guess is how no, I would yeah. say that. The, um, the character design of Diana, I'm with Craig on that. That was thing that, you know, his choice on that did kind of bum me out. Um, that she doesn't, she doesn't have the Amazonian uh, stance mm-hmm. and, you know, in physical appearance so much her, um, sh- the character came across as a little too mousy, uh, you know, with a couple of exceptions in the book, she seemed a little like, she's like, she's going on about feeling helpless and feeling weak. And I'm like, I'm reading that coming from Diana and I'm like, oh man, that kind of yeah. bums me out. That's not her, you know, her not being able to fly you know, depressing her kind of like turned me off a little bit, but overall I really liked the book. Um, that one panel where she kicks the table over. Mm -hmm. I love that panel. That looked amazing, man. That was cool. Um, I really like to know why Batman was sitting on the couch in his bat suit. Maybe he was there when the Holocaust hit at the end. He's just chilling out on the couch. Look, sometimes Alfred brought him a cucumber sandwich. (laughs) He'd had a hard night and then the bombs went off. He he just ate the bomb. Yeah. He's like, fuck it. I'm just going to sit here and just (laughs) watch some TV while the bomb goes off. I fought my fight. Yeah. (laughs) That panel, I just looked at that for quite a while. (laughs) So there's something that it's interesting that you, you bring that up. Um, Cause to me, when she, when she got her wonder woman suit, uh, I'd say it's interesting that you bring that up, the her looking mousy and not having that stature, and that we all notice that. But 
to me, Daniel Warren Johnson, and this is having having read a lot of his work, you're reading a book like this and you're like, God bless, like this is happening fast. There's a ton in this. Like, I mean, it took, as I was like making my notes, I had four pages worth of notes for, for one book. But I think you have to stop and take a minute to appreciate his level of control over balance, at least for me in this, because I, because I going back and look at this, yeah, I'm, as I'm looking at the some of the stills on my computer, those initial stills of her growing up, of her being in Themyscira, and when they she first wakes up, except for that moment where she first busts out of the the tube, the rest of them she does look weakened, quote unquote, and she does look minuscule compared to what we think of her. But then she has that moment in the middle of the battle, and she feels like in that moment she feels like Diana to me, and she, she honestly starts to look more like Diana. And I think that's kind of a visual trick that DWJ is playing on us, uh, and, and the same with, uh, with the, the desolation of how she feels, and it kind of slows those moments down, and it sinks you into the narrative, and it kind of puts you in that headspace. And then when you have that moment, it, it excites you, it entices you, it, like it energizes you as a reader. And I think that's part of DWJ understanding the balance of narrative understanding how these things craft to to control the reader's emotions. And at least it worked on me. Now, it might not work for everybody, but from my own experience reading this, that moment where she like she's out in the battlefield, like that is a triumvirate moment. Uh, and, and I felt like I was reading Diana. Oh, and, the, the scene where she's standing after she has saved the city mm-hmm. and she's standing in the arena and they're all chanting to her. That's a, I mean, that's an amazing page. Right. Like the art on it's amazing. And I love the... Uh, the character design of the Hydra and yeah. things like that. I mean, it's definitely his art style, which is, again, it's great. I love his art. Uh, it was just that one little minor complaint. Yeah. To be yeah. Honest with you. My hangups are just personal hangups yeah. about the character of Diana. Right. That's, yeah. that's all. Well, and I think, and, and that's, so, so I've, I've had those hangups with other Elseworlds still, not particularly about this story. And I think that's one of the, that's one of the minefields that you, when you do an yeah, Elseworld when you do an Else World story, is is having that liberty to do something out of continuity and do something away from the, the the characterization, and still remain true to somebody's idea of it. And sometimes people are successful, and sometimes they're not. And I think that's like I said, that's always a trepidation you run into with an Else World's tale. <clears throat> and for some, it works. For some, it didn't. And you know, well, it's, I'm, it's, I'm with Matt on a couple of the things. I mean, I just don't see her whining about yeah. not being able to fly. She would just deal with it and move yeah. on. Yeah, but. I guess that was also just a narrative way to say she no longer has that ability, mm-hmm. you know, so that yeah. is, you know, a thing. Well, if you tie it into what some of the things that happen, and again, you can't tie it into some of the more recent Wonder Woman stuff, but, uh, and, and one of the arcs from, was it G Willow Wilson who was writing it more yeah. recently? Mm-hmm. Um, there was those moments also because love was out of the world and Diana does take so much of her power mm-hmm. from love, mm-hmm. uh, as, as a concept. And when love was out of the world, you have these moments of just weakness. It's kind of like when you hide Superman away from the sun and he gets weak. And so the absence of love, she does kind of wilt. And and maybe that's what he was going for. Again, like you can only yeah. guess at these things. No, the story, and, and I'm breaking my own rule with this because I personally think that you can only judge a story, any story, by what it gives you, not by what you can speculate. So a little bit of hypocrisy on my part, but that's pretty par for my course, I think. Um, <laughs> so, uh, you no, know. So if you base it on, you know, when, when Superman doesn't have his power, when he's not getting radiation from the sun, mm-hmm. he gets scrawny and shrinks. If we take that same narrative for this book, Mm -hmm. that the earth has been damaged due to the nuclear war, maybe, maybe that is the reason. And there's no love in the earth. Yeah. I mean, it's a little bit of both. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I I mean, I really, I love the story. I, I have to believe that he is a fan of Star Wars. Oh yeah. I felt she looked like Finn when Mm -hmm. he wakes up out of the coma with the white suit and the hoses hanging off of her, um, the the city is named a new hope yeah and the uh the hydra thing looks very much like the uh the monster that obi-wan kenobi fights in the arena scene in attack of the clones Mm -hmm. so you know with the claws coming down piercing people and stuff so i um there was to me quite a few nods to star wars in there which always gets bonus points for me right (laughs) (laughs) but Um, no uh, yeah i 
in Mad Max, such a feel of Mad Max in yeah. the story. Very, very much a wasteland. Like, yeah. just nailed that that vibe. But, and again, part of why I love DWJ, and that's why I love his work on Murder Falcon and stuff, too, is because he can take this, it's almost like in a metal song, the, the trial, the drum, da da dum da dum da dum Like, that's what the story is all, up until a moment of just really heartfelt human moment. And to, to me, that story in this took place when, she was having that moment in the cell talking to D like that. The story got quiet then and otherwise really loud, really, really tromping story. So was D in the cell next to her or was she visiting her? Because I felt like she had just taken the food to her sister and said, here's our reward. I interpreted it as she was in the cell, but she might have just been. I mean, either way, it's not that there. big of a plot point, but yeah. yeah. I, I could see it being both. Yeah. Very, I, like I said, I I, I interpreted. It I, way, I took it as like she felt guilty and went down there to go tell her she was sorry. But maybe, either way, maybe I, it's it. not yeah. again not a big plot point. But um, interesting how sometimes we can see. Well, for for me, it made <laughs> like the idea of her being in the cell made Thaden more of an evil bastard, and I really wanted to hate that dude. I don't think so, he was so well, much. He made of it pretty easy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he, he is an evil bastard, and he's very much like the governor yeah. in Walking Dead. Um, or even Negan a little bit, mm-hmm. but, uh, you know, it, it, he's also trying to run the city the only yeah. way he knows how, but you know, it, I'm not excusing his actions. I mean, he's Hey dude, Im- image, yeah. nobody wants image and Joe's day job. Nobody wants that job. Yeah. No, one, <laughs> so. no one wants, <laughs> I, I mean, if you, in an apocalypse, so you do want to be the person controlling the water for sure. <laughs> um, I, I can't get enough of this book, man. Uh, I think it's great. I I don't think that there has ever been an imprint or a I don't I don't know what you call it that I have ever done such a hard turnaround in the DC Black Label books because if you go back and listen to episodes yeah, from earlier in the you year you hated it I wasn't you hated feeling the it. concept of I it. wasn't feeling it at all and now they're just hit after, I wish they would get away from the Harley and Joker books a little bit because they're over I'm not digging those with that um, but stuff like this is just. Uh, hands to me it's one of the amazing. best stuff coming out of dc right now is in the mm. black label stuff oh, and yes. the and the dark uh universe stuff yeah as far as even mainstream comics yeah. uh, you know y- y- the big three yeah everything about these the fact that they're they're not beholden to continuity they're able to take risks they're able to take narrative license they're these big formats i mean these things are yeah, huge. i was gonna say what do you guys feel about the magazine size format on these books i uh, again part of my turnaround and i just say this is when I first got it, I didn't like it cause I had to go buy a magazine box and I had to buy different bags and boards. But look, comics are four and $5 now. And I think I've said this on the show before. If I'm spending four or $5, give me, make it feel like it's four make or $5. it feel like I'm, I'm getting my money's worth. And I feel like I'm getting my money's worth on this. Yeah. So what about you on that one, Matt? I didn't yeah, I jump think, ahead of you. There. I think this format fits very, very well specifically with, Daniel Warren Johnson's art style yeah. mm-hmm. and uh, well, and his art style and the amount of work and detail he puts into a page, uh, this format specifically, um, really benefits from that. So yeah, I have to have a magazine box anyways, because I get some magazines right. that I collect. So, uh, to me, it wasn't that big of a deal as far as having collecting. I know that's been some complaints from collectors is, you know, I have to store these differently. I can't just throw them in my box. Gives a shit. Yeah. <laughs> People like to complain about everything, but I, that, I, was, I was asking because have to that's, buy a different box. Yeah, I mean, I'm asking because that's a thing, you know, it, it is, it's, it's a space thing. Um, but I, people do like to whine though, Matt, I will give you well, that. So, uh, and, and part of that, I think the, the key issue here is you're, you're literally talking about format. So yes, there is the yeah. issue of having to go buy different boxes. If you bag and board your stuff at home yourself, got to buy different bags and boards. If you like, I, you know, I still read, manually or analog i don't know not digital uh i don't i don't read on a tablet i read analog too <laughs> o's and ones don't read on automatic uh, <laughs> I, I what i'm saying is i don't read on a tablet so yeah. that's a different experience but even even if you do read on the tablet these are formatted in a different like it's not 11 by 14 yeah. where, you know these these have a different shape to them and i think i think it's a good blend of of both transferability to a, a digital medium to a digital platform such as a tablet or a laptop to also holding it in your hand. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it, th- there's a, there's a cool bit of transference there that just works in our, our age, this era that we live in of, of comics. Well, I think if you look at, look at flip through this book and then flip through the other, D, you know, another DC black label book, the question, mm-hmm. uh, 
I don't really think the question benefited from the format. You don't think so? Not nearly like this did. Yeah. Not nearly as much as this did. I think that could have been in a standard format, not taken away from anything. I didn't feel like that format added much to that book. I need to go back and look, but I don't remember there being a lot of background. It's just, that. yeah. yeah. I Which felt, is, it's a question book. There doesn't necessarily well, need to be. I felt like the form- detail, it certainly. Yeah. yeah. I just, I felt like the format was not, was more or less wasted on that question book. Did Where you? this, is, no, I didn't feel that way at all. Yeah, I didn't okay. feel like the question book needed to be black label in my opinion, but Maybe that's not. another topic for another convers- that's, conversation I would, for another day. I would something. love to have that conversation at some point though, because that, like that, the mechanics of, of reading and stuff, I find that very interesting. What are you, yeah. what's happening uh, now? Fuck it. We can, sure. Um, so, I, like, like I, I wonder why that is. I, I look at me taking risks and getting off the schedule. Matt's like, let me put a little chaos in here. Twist, twist the nipple. Um, so, with that book, maybe I was like, I love the question, but I, I don't really like the, the format. Didn't detract from no, it on, no. on that by any means. Like, I don't think the, the format would have been any different if it was a a regular size comic. Mm-hmm. I didn't feel that way. Um, yeah. I think like the DWJ book, Wonder Woman, Dead Earth, 100% benefited from yep. having a larger scale. Mm-hmm. Um, and there are some books that, that do and some books that don't, but the same can be said when you're reading, uh, when, when you read collected editions, if you're not reading just the regular size trade paperbacks, like I'm, you know, if you get these big omnibus size stuff, you know, I'm looking at the omnibus of the massive right now, that's bigger than a standard size format. And the images inside there are bigger. Yeah. And, even though I know a lot of people don't like the the heft of a, of a tome of that size, I enjoy reading that way because you are getting a larger surface. You are you are able to you've got more square inch to for your eyes to graze over yeah. um, than you do in a standard format. And if you're gonna have a highly detailed book, th- these these big images, then that that does serve to to. I, I don't know if it increases the enjoyment of the experience. If there's any comeuppance to that, but it does something. Uh, on an emotional level with your connection to what you're holding in your hand. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, if, I, if the art is served as such, I should well, say. Well, yeah. yeah. And I, yes. I need to go back and look at it because I didn't think about that when I was reading the question book. What, who That was Lemire and I don't remember who the artist uh, was. Uh, Bill and the guy's name. Sinkevitz. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. Lemire and Sinkevitz, which is an astounding team. Yeah. Right. Um, Sinkevitz's art. Oh, wait a minute. No, no, no. That was, it was the old question artist. Uh, Dennis Cowan. Cowan. Okay, Sorry. that makes sense. Sorry, I was I was wondering why I couldn't re- because Sinkevitz's art is so abstract. Sinkevitz so... inked it, I think. I oh, okay. think you're right because I remember his name being attached to that. His art is so abstract and uh, stand out uh, that I would imagine that it would be with Bill Cowan again. Like I, I love Bill Cowan and I think he he did a great job on that book. But yeah, I, the art to me on that book didn't. Uh, it wasn't disserved by the format. So it's interesting to think about as I'm processing this in real time, it's interesting to think about what type of art benefits from a larger uh, surface area. For me, it's the more detail. You think so? I, I, I do. Um, you know, I love Ryan Otley. I loved his work on, on Invincible. Mm-hmm. But I don't think his art would benefit from a larger format because he doesn't do a lot of background work. Right. It's all focused on or mostly focused on the characters with minimal background work. So I, I don't see any reason to take somebody like his art and put it into a big format. Yeah. Now I'd love to see East of West mm-hmm. in a large stuff. format. See, in my brain I'm thinking about somebody like David Mazzucchelli and not necessarily his you know, not necessarily his Daredevil stuff or his Batman stuff, but his um, Asterios Polyp. Have you ever read that? So that was his his postmodern uh, graphic novel that he wrote uh, that he doing a lot with symbolism and shape and um, texture. Uh, he kind of takes the breaks it down to the, the bare bones of comics and the bare bones of, of, of symbolism and what you can put on the page. Uh, Asterios is a. He's an architect who designs houses, so there's almost a geometric uh, study being done on the page, and there's not, it's not highly detailed. It is very much the, you know, a circle and two dots can make a face kind of ideology, but to me, that book, you know, having seen it in a smaller format and a larger format, it, to me, that it does benefit from having the greater surface mm-hmm. area, which is, it's not highly detailed, but there's got to be a connective link. There's got to be a connective link that that those two of those things that bridges that gap that makes it from an artistic perspective, I would think, I mean, that being said, our artistry doesn't, 
you know, there's no formula for artistry. So maybe there's not, maybe it's just part of the magic. I, I don't know. I, I just think it's fascinating. It, um, I mean, it really is because we, we could all sit here and deter- and come up with multiple answers for why a certain book could be prestige format yeah. versus, you know, standard format and probably get, you know, multiple answers from each yeah. one of us. Um, but again, art is so subjective mm-hmm. that what draws your attention to it in a prestige format may be, for me, like, yeah, this was kind of wasted space. Usually it's butts. That doesn't butts. mean. Butts. Large format butts. So, all right, we, we've <laughs> melted faces <laughs> with this high concept, nonsensical talk that we've been doing. Um, I want to hear from Matt. I want to hear what you read this week, brother. What Drop something on us. So my book of the week. Oh, he's going to reveal his secret. That's now. right. Yeah, he, uh, he would not tell us. He would not tell us what it was. So 1994's event comics, Ash number one. Never heard of this. Have you? I have I actually owned that book. You do? Yeah, I haven't read it, but I do own it. So how did you come across it? How did I own it? In a bought it in a collection. Okay. So um this was a event comics <clears throat> was an imprint that uh, Joe Quesada and Jimmy Palamiotti uh, launched back in the nineties mm-hmm. as part of the nineties boom. They didn't jump on board with image, they decided to do their own thing. So this was their first imprint and the first property they had attached to it. Um, I bought these when they came out in the nineties. There were several short arcs that came out. This first one was six issues and they did a few other arcs that were three issues a piece, something like that. And I bought them all. What attracted me to it was the art on it. Mm -hmm. Uh, These guys, you know, a lot of people, Joe Quesada has a lot of detractors because he's got such a unique style and, um, you know, reading comics back when he actually used to draw comics right? so long ago, people seemed to either like him or hate him. And I always liked him because it was unique looking. And he was, a, I mean, he was a quality artist. Just to, it's kind of like Sam Keith. Right. Uh, it was Sam Keith. I love Sam Keith because everything was weird looking and wild and mm-hmm. unique. And I like Joe Quesada for the, for those reasons. And of course, Jimmy, him and Jimmy Palmiotti, they were, they were Palmiotti. Palmiotti, they were together. These guys never worked separately back in the day. Right. They were glued together at the hip. Uh, so anyway, this comic, this is a story about a New York firefighter named Ashley, uh, whom gets severely burned uh, while saving an infant from a burning burning apartment building. Uh, he's rushed to the hospital with severe burns over 90% of his body is not expected to survive. However, two hours later, he's made a full recovery, much to the surprise of his fellow firefighters. Uh, There is no rational explanation for this, obviously. Uh, Once home in his apartment with his two cats. And the two cats thing in this book is like, okay, somebody has these two cats. This is obvious. Whose cats are these? The whole time I'm reading it, I'm like, this is somebody's cats. Turns out it's Joe Quesada's cats. Uh, So he dozes off on the couch and has a dream of a humanoid fire being with the voice of his father's telling him to stay back and that you are not a hero. Uh, meanwhile, cut to the Brooklyn bridge on which there is bumper to bumper traffic and two women are sitting in a car. The passenger is sharing a funny story with her fellow, with the, you know, the, the her fellow passenger whom is driving and the driver suddenly screams that she hates traffic as she rear ends the car in front of them and bails out of the car in a rage. <laughs> she screams that she is going home, but runs full speed into a tanker truck hauling gasoline and it explodes <laughs> into flames. Uh, at this time, Ashley is sleeping. Sounds like all it's missing is the dolphin flying through the window. <laughs> that 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 part right there, I'm like, okay, that is a New Yorker's fantasy. Uh-huh. Bailing out of bumper to bird truck and running, <laughs> exploding with rage. Somebody's thought about that a lot, right? So sorry, I didn't mean to. That's the, exactly. There, but... How can I work this into a story? Is what Joe Casada, <laughs> Jimmy were thinking. Comics therapy. Yeah. So. At this time, Ashley is sleeping on the couch when the local news reports the explosion. He wakes up to begin vomiting flames, and that fire consumes him. He's then transformed into a large man wearing a New York firefighter's outfit, and he's got, like, some gauntlets on. Uh, He grabs the keys from the table, jumps out the window, and speeds off on Ash's motorcycle. There's a panel that where he takes his finger and, like, burns the license plate. 
like <laughs> like he takes a moment to think, okay, I don't want people tracking the bike. It's kind of funny, but anyway, so he does that. Uh, of course, he's heading to the Brooklyn Bridge, and once he gets there, he's confronted by this dragonish looking creature with the head of the woman whom earlier had jumped from her car. Uh, surrounded by flame, she tells him that she's not having a good day and that some she's going to take it out on somebody. <laughs> I guess if you turn into a dragon, that is a bad day. Yeah, yeah. I, you got to love 90s comics. Yeah. And uh, so this, com- this comic is, um, I mean, it's better than most 90s comics. Uh-huh. Uh, the colors in it are done all via computer, as was the... As the style at the time, burgeoning digital coloring, and um, you know that this the t- the ash. See the way that ash mm-hmm. that that is token computer graphics. Yeah, and does that ever turn me off, man? That yeah. looks ge- that is a generic computer graphic, but at the time it was hot. It was cutting edge. Hot. Yeah, yeah. we're using computers forefront of the digital experience yeah. i mean you yeah. think about the 90s and where computers were at then yeah yeah i mean yeah well and at the time whenever this you know that was the thing everybody loved it because yeah. it was so vibrant and new and right. different and clean looking yeah but then over time man it, everything looked the same that's the thing there was no artistry to it so it all started looking the same it does not I'm, well i mean look we some of us watched beast wars as kids and thought it was amazing digital graphics and when you it, you can't watch it now yeah uh, because it was just in it was in that that period the product where of its time technology was just it was almost there but it hadn't quite gotten there but at the time you had to these these were growing pains is what i'm trying to say <laughs> so. yeah this well and it's it's funny the industry ended up getting away from it you know the the computer graphics thing but at the time man it looked cool especially the flames all mm-hmm. the you know the flames in these in these stories, but, um, you know, this is what these guys did <clears throat> right up until they got uh, hired by Marvel to take over the Marvel Knights imprint. Yeah. yeah. They did. They just did this right up until they took over and breathed new life into that whole imprint. And of course, then that just took off. Yeah. Like Jimmy, fire. Jimmy Casada's career was in management from the, that yeah. day forward. And he's done, yeah. did amazing things to breathe new life into mm-hmm. Marvel comics in general. Amazing things. I mean, right. he, I mean, you could say he saved Marvel comics. A lot of people would say that, but he definitely turned that shit oh, he around. Did. No, he, he 100% did because I mean, you look at what was happening with Marvel in the nineties, uh, the lack of money, the having to sell off their properties. Yeah. I mean that turnaround, like he played a big, big role in that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I mean, Marvel was struggling at the time. Yeah. If you don't follow him on Twitter, you should. He cracks me up. <laughs> it's, really? it's funny. Did you see that? Speaking of, did you see that recent news story that came out about uh, Palmiotti? No. <clears throat> he recently Please told us. don't a, ruin Palmiotti for me. No, no, oh, this is okay. good. No, this is, no, this is, <laughs> it took me a second to realize what you were talking about. Uh, <clears throat> no, he um he, he's shared a story recently how years ago his neighbor came to him, was like doing a spring cleaning, and he's like, hey, I got some comic books looking to get rid of. You want them? And he's like, eh, I guess. Goes over. No, they weren't comic books. It was a shitload of original art. Wow. Alex Toth. Why does that not happen to me? Yeah. yeah. Where's my yeah? Alex Toth and other other legends of the and and Palmiotti's like, uh, bro. Yeah. This, this is, is original art. These aren't comic books, and these are worth a lot of money. Yeah. You know, and the guy's like, nah, just take them. I got no use for them. And he's like, no, nah, dude, you could sell these for money. Nah. And just. <laughs> Yeah, so he's got all this original art, dude. His neighbor gifted him. He didn't need that. I do. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, you know, there is a thing that's going around where they're buying up this old art and taking it to the original artist so yeah. they can resell it because back when they back then yeah, a yeah, lot yeah. of them gave it away. So you know, well, a lot of them had it taken away. Yeah, yeah. Well, that too. So uh, maybe some of that landed back in. The I hands would hope of the so. That'd be cool. Artist. That would be really cool if it did. Absolutely. 90s comics are so much fun. For their own reasons, they're fun. They're just energetic. I, I mean, just re- <laughs> as, as things fall off the table, sorry. Uh, th- there's an energy about those early 90s comics that, uh, you know, more than the sum of its parts. You know, and for re- sure. reading the advertisements for the other 90s comics are fun. <laughs> energy Because they have, they have things like, there's an advertisement for Spawn, and the advertisement says, almost monthly. <laughs> That is amazing. Yeah, yeah. As the <laughs> almost you know, months. Yeah, as, as deadlines were not so much deadlines back in the nineties. Suggestions. Uh, I mean, they're not so much deadlines now. Uh, oh, shit. I feel dude, like comics the, are a lot more oh, yeah. on schedule now than they were. They then. are, dude. but not image comics. Oh, they're you, so, the nineties image comics deadlines were stupid bad. You think they're loose now? 
oh my gosh, you'd go, you might have a new issue of, say, uh, Dale Keown's Pit every three months. Yeah. Maybe. Uh, you never knew when Spawn was going to hit the shelf. I remember going into the comic book shop. Did the Spawn come out? And he's like, no, nah, I don't know when I'm getting it. Did Spawn come out? No, nah, not yet. You know, I mean, it was whack. I mean, it'd be hard to stay on comics. Like yeah. that, you know, yeah. it's a it's a big complaint now when comics miss their dates. Southern that, Bastards saga. Southern Bastards just ended. Yeah, I don't think it's missing dates. They just <laughs> stopped. Just Jason missing. Aaron got busy doing Marvel stuff, and yeah. that was that. Yeah, maybe I don't know. I think Latour. He's, there's got to be more coming to that. Oh, I anyway, think they're going to go back to it. We digress. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> What'd you read this week, Greg? So you know, sometimes the segue gods. Uh-huh. offer you a gift and you have to take it. You just open your hands up. Yeah. And Earlier it. we talked about the Iron Lady. You take the Segway fins? Yes. Earlier we talked about the Iron Lady. I'm going to talk about the Iron Duke. Oh, nice. Yeah. Um, I'm going to talk about Wellington Number 1 by IDW, written by Aaron Mankey and Delilah Dawson, art by Piatra Kalaski, I think is how you say it. And Colors by Brad Simpson. I got the Brad Simpson name right. (laughs) Jesus Christ. (laughs) So this is the (laughs) quote-unquote true story of Arthur Wesley, the Uh first Duke of Wellington. Yes, that Duke of Wellington, the Iron Duke, the one that defeated Napoleon at at Waterloo, the two-time Prime Minister of England, etc., etc. This is his true story, quote-unquote. So he brings in a uh, reporter, Joseph drew to come see the old retired Wellington in his family home. Mm -hmm. And uh, drew shows up and uh, Wellington tells him he's going to tell him the truth of his exploits. Yes. He did all of those battles and he was that he's known for, and he was involved in all of that. But his real thing was to fight for something more than what history will tell us. And that was against evil. Hmm. So obviously this is going to be a story, a book that's going to tell us these stories where he goes and fights these different versions of evil. And uh, this particular one has him being called to the home of lady Olivia Sparrow, who is also a historical figure from that time. The letter Wellington receives from Sparrow tells of a missing child, a spectral black dog, and a murdered man killed under arcane circumstances. So Wellington heads to her home with his wife and a couple of his men in tow. And once there, he tells Lady Sparrow that while a missing child is horrific, there's nothing, you know, really unusual about that in this time and area. And the dog with the growing, glowing red eyes is probably just some drunkard's false tale of what he saw that night. Right. And she says, well, you know, that that's all true, but explain this. And she takes him in and shows him this dead body laying on the table. And this guy's been dead for 20 days and shows no sign of decay yet. He's got a slash marks across his chest that look like they're from a large animal, like a mm-hmm. bear or a large dog or something. But the really weird part is he's got runes tattooed all over his body oh. on his arms and both legs metal. and uh, <laughs> <laughs> Matt just whispers metal in the background <laughs> <laughs> and so Wellington inquires as to where the uh, body was found and she explains to him it was at a local mine where he actually worked at so he heads to this mine to see what he can find <clears throat> well on the way Uh, He finds some dog tracks and begins to assume the man was killed by a pack of wild dogs. He arrives at the mine to find it closed with a large black crow sitting at the entrance. To To his surprise, the crow starts answering his questions in German. Oh. In, he, he says, ja or nine to everything that Wellington says. (laughs) So, you know, you got a talking crow, you've got a closed off mine. He's like, oh, this is getting weirder by the minute. So he goes into the uh, mine and he finds a book with some runes in it. And these are the same exact runes that were tattooed or Um, marked on. I mean, whether it was tattooed or marked, I'm not 100% sure on the murdered man. And so he's like, okay, well, this is even getting stranger now. 
And perhaps I should have brought a flashlight or a lantern with me Mm -hmm. to this mine because it's storming outside and I can't see shit. So I'm going to go back to the manor. So he heads back to the manor and on the way back, he's being chased by a wolf or a large dog, one or the other. He shoots the animal and either misses or it goes through it. It's not absolutely clear but the wolf keeps chasing him yeah and eventually catches him and he's on his horse so this wolf chases him down on horseback tears him off of the horse he draws his sword slashes at the wolf the wolf doesn't even whimper the horse runs off and he gets back on and takes off but the wolf just stands there staring at him so he gets back he gets his horse taken care of it's not nice to stare yeah and he goes back into the manor to find a strange lady sitting there who's been waiting for him. And he's like, yes. And, you know, I no one knew I was here. How did you know I was here? And she's like, well, I threw the bones and their message was clear. The devil himself has crawled up from hell and I'm to help you find him. And that's where the story ends. It's a hell of a job application. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I threw the bones and the message was clear. I'm not sure this is a true story. Early, yeah, I'm, 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 early form of text messaging. So, you know, obviously this isn't a story that we haven't heard before. Mm-hmm. It's very League of Extraordinary Gentlemen by Alan Moore and Kevin O'Neill. And even more recently, Adam Glass and Patrick Hollis. Uh, yeah. Rough Riders. Yep. That's where I was um, going with it. Kind of a Hellboy feel to it, too. Yeah. But it, but it doesn't mean that it, it's not interesting no. and it's in a fresh take on this kind of, you have a historical figure out fighting evil story. Um, the art on this book is so good, both the colors and the art. I mean, you guys can just, I brought it so you can look at, but the, usually when you see the cover of a book, that's the exception. Mm-hmm. And the interior art is not quite as good as the cover. Every page inside the book is as good cover as this quality. cover. Wow. Um, the amount of detail that's drawn in the background, uh, you know, they're sitting in these old manors in, you know, the 1800s mm-hmm. and you can just picture all these, uh, uh, paintings and stuff that they always had just like stacked together. I mean, they, all of that's done with incredible detail throughout, uh, the book, the colors. I mean, uh. Brad Simpson's going to be on my short list for colors for this year for really? this one book alone. Yeah. It's that well done. Uh, the story is fast paced. It's, uh, you know, it gives you what you need in the opening three or four pages that, Hey, we're going to tell you these stories. I'm telling, you know, he's telling yeah. you it from his retired standpoint and then it moves on. It doesn't like linger in this guy following him around and him telling, it just moves on and starts telling you the stories. So. so I'm curious about this and, and, I don't know after one issue if you can answer the question or not, but one of the things that that gets me about these books and it detracts when I'm reading them, not this book, but books like this is when they, yes, you have the supernatural and and those elements to it, but it's when they detract from the, uh, I would say the the mechanics of the mundane world. Like you have all this stuff going on, then all of a sudden, and this was kind of what got me, even though I loved Rough Riders, when Theodore Roosevelt walks out in like a steampunk battle suit. Like I didn't enjoy that. So if you're going to use the, you can use the magic and stuff, but keep the, the mundane part of it. Uh, it, it keeps it very to the grounded time. to that time period. Okay, good, 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 um, good, 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 good. Yeah, it, there's, there's, there's supernatural elements that he's fighting. Right. But he's not necessarily supernatural. Yeah. He's just himself. Uh, especially the, the colors and the backgrounds on this was just amazing to me. Um, well, it's like, like books like Solomon Kane. That's, that's what I like about it because it stays – kind of period specific sure yeah, yeah. And, and and again you know horses mm-hmm. you hear if you talk to any comic book artist they'll tell you oh, they the hate horse drawing thing. horses yep. there's horses throughout this book and they're drawn beautifully yeah you know so to me when you see that it's uh it's always a, a good sign so i was really supl- surprised i texted you guys earlier in the day and said i don't know what the hell i'm going to talk about this week mm-hmm. and i got to that book and i was like oh hey Look, the art's beautiful. The story's fun, and you know, and yeah. well, again, while it's not necessarily a new take on a story, it can still be done interestingly. Sure, mm-hmm. yeah. So, I mean, whether it's a werewolf or what, we don't know yet, but um, a lot of interesting. I'm definitely in on it. Did you notice anything about the crow? I did not. What's up? It's got a dead eye. 
It's, oh yeah, yes. Yeah. It's, it's Odin's raven. Oh, yeah. very possibly. It's got the the scar. Like, I mean, that's what they're that's what's they're interjecting with. Just yeah, part of that Norse mythology. Um, Odin having the the two crows. But yeah, no, it's the he's missing the eye. So yeah. that very well could be Odin. Yeah, that's, that's that'd dope. be awesome too. So yeah, I mean, I'm I'm in. I'm excited to see where the story goes. If nothing else, I'm going to collect it for the art alone. Oh, for sure. Yeah, art looks great. Yeah, IDW is crushing it, man. Yeah, they they've got some very good uh, books going on right now. Yeah, as I was flipping through the previews catalog uh, last night, night before last, uh, one of those nights, um, IDW and Dark Horse were the standouts as far as like the their, your main publishers. Uh, what they've got going on this next year, you should pay attention to those of you at home who may not be. Um, get away from your, your Marvel and DC stuff every once in a while. Well, I like to see that IDW is doing some stuff that's not just uh, children's properties and right. intellectual properties. Because for me, that's what they've been for a minute. Mm-hmm. So to see them start to branch out into some things beyond that. I mean, Turtles are great. <laughs> I love the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. But I don't know that a company can rely on one intellectual property to prop them up. So. Doesn't it doesn't seem like it? Yeah, um, it seems like they're they're definitely moving forward into a new uh, territory for them. Yeah, and I think that's one of the mistakes that Dark Horse made too. It, it tied so much into Star Wars and to all of these other things uh, that eventually went home to be with Marvel. They yeah yeah. Well, um, you know, it, if Mike Mignola had not well, been yeah, exactly there, uh, absolutely, I don't know that Dark Horse would have survived the. Uh, Disney purchasing Star yeah. Wars. I think Jeff Lemire, uh, his Black Hammer stuff Black Hammer, does is, it it's certainly helped. Well. But I mean, that initial loss of mm-hmm. properties that they had. All right. Well, I read some stuff this week too. Yeah. Uh, I read a book. It was actually a, I'm, I, I'm getting out of my wheelhouse, kind of. Um, as much out of my wheelhouse as, as I'm going <laughs> to Wheelhouse gonna adjacent. Uh, it, well, it is. So <laughs> I read and, and people listening at home, they're gonna, like, "That's going to click when I say this." I read some manga this this past uh, this past week, and it, it, that's something that doesn't get spoken about a, a lot on the show because I, I mean we all read so much, we're kind of set in our own ways. Um, but one of my favorite manga, or arguably one of the most, uh, other than the guy who makes One Piece, one of the most famous manga artists uh, around is, is Junji Ito, uh, and. Definitely, for my taste, one of the best. I you know called him the Japanese Bernie Wrightson before. You're not, um, wrong. and he he put out a book. It was was it this year or last year? I forget. Um, I have to go look at the dates. But it's uh, it was Frankenstein, and the first part of the Frankenstein. Book, I think that came out this year. Was it? it yeah. it's probably on my short list. I gotta yeah. I gotta go back and look at my lists. Um, so. And this what the story that I want to talk about comes out of the Frankenstein collection, and that story is called Pen Pals, and of course, like I said, by Junji Ito, and it comes out of the the Frankenstein collection. And once you get past the Shelley stuff, the the actual like adaptation that he does, which is it's about a third of it uh, of the book, most of the stories after that, um, they center around different versions of this boy named Oshikiri, and the stories in and of themselves come together the short story part of it to make this kind of a quote-unquote frankenstein's monsters of small narratives which is i think what he was going for thematically and it's really cool especially considering like i said the subject matter of the book but it's not you know this is not unlike what we've gotten from from junji ito before it was it was a little bit more of the same from you know the japanese master of horror which you know i I don't mean to sound like that's not a complaint per se it's junji ito so i'll take more of anything he gives us kind of any damn day um but back to the actual story at hand, just this singular story, uh, pen pals, that I want to talk about. Um, this boy named Oshikiri, he wakes up and he's had this this nightmare. And the nightmare itself, I'm not going to get into too much of it because it, it kind of gets into the broader story collection. It's one of those things that kind of threads them all together. Um, so I don't really want to tell you about that here. We don't really have time. But you really get... Uh, y- you need to read the collection for yourself for it to make sense. Um <laughs> Because what he's doing is he's seeing an alternate version of himself uh, that's talking to him, this kind of shadowy figure, this evil version. But, you know, again, I digress. Um, Oshikiri wakes up and he's trying to, you know, he's kind of trying to shake the cobwebs off of this nightmare he's had. And, you know, he's he's a kid and he's got school that day. So he gets dressed and he's thinking to himself, you know, I might be having these nightmares because, hell, maybe, I don't know, maybe I'm lonely. Um, Oshikiri, he's kind of a solidly upper middle class kid. Uh, he lives in this big house, this kind of 
McMansion, um, and currently both of his parents. McMansion, is that what you said? Yeah. Um, <laughs> you ever heard that? Have you heard that before? McMansion? No. I oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. You know, they're, they're all built the same out in the suburbs, but, uh, you know, they're five bedrooms, but they all kind of have the same floor plan. Gotcha. They're okay. Golf course gotcha. homes, they're, so to yeah, speak. Gotcha. Gotcha. Um, and, you know, both at this point in time, both of his parents are kind of away on business. He's kicking it out there by himself. And, you know, he he's used to spending plenty of time alone. That's not the necessarily issue per se, but he doesn't know what's causing these nightmares. So maybe he needs to go out and make some friends or maybe even he needs to go get himself a girlfriend, um, spend some time with somebody. And all this time alone may not be good for a boy his age, which that kind of tracks, right? That makes sense. He's a level-headed kid. Uh, you know, he's, he's logical. Um, it's a logical conclusion to come to. Uh, and so he, he goes to school that day and he does this thing. He goes to his classes, he kind of meanders about, um, forgets about his nightmare. And by the end of the day, he's getting ready to leave. He's going to go home. Um, so he walks outside and as he gets outside, he realizes that, Hey, it's a little nipply out here. It's you know getting close to winter. And he's like, Oh, well, you know, shit, I forgot my scarf. My neck's cold. So I better dip back in and go grab my scarf. And, and he does. And he's walking down the school to go get a scarf walking down the hallway and he sees this girl in this art classroom and she's just painting away. Um, she's doing like a self portrait and he thinks to himself, Hey, I, I know her. That's, that's Satomi. And Satomi, she's kind of a loner figure too. She's always by herself. She's hanging out after school, just doing her painting. Doesn't have a lot of friends. It doesn't seem like, uh, she just kind of does her, does her thing. And he thinks to himself, Hey, maybe this is who I need to be hanging out with. Like she's a loner. I'm a loner. Shit. Let's go see what's up. Um, so he goes in and Oshikiri kind of musters up his inner playa playa, so to speak. And he's going to go, you know, he's getting ready to go spit some game. He's going to go talk to this girl. And he's like, Hey girl, uh, you know, those are some pretty mad painting skills you got there. How you doing? And dude, our, our boy has exactly 0% game. None. It's, it's pretty bad. Um, he's definitely going to die a virgin at this point. Um, so Tomi kind of looks at Oshikiri and gets the reaction that you expect from somebody who just zero game she doesn't say shit <laughs> she just looks at him kind of gives him up and down and she just starts packing up her painting supplies <laughs> and she's just gonna go she's, she's not giving a time of day um i mean solidly one of the coldest burns in comics history quite possibly um our, our dude might he, like he should have just left his dick in the other room he didn't need to bring it with him um but hey oshikiri is persistent right like he's this he's like hey hey no, no, don't stop painting don't don't do that i didn't mean to bother you um wh- why are you always by yourself in here anyway you know do you not have any friends and which is exactly what you say when you're trying to impress a girl. Um, and this, this strikes enough of a nerve that it, it kind of breaks the ice. She's like, yeah, I've got friends. Of course I got friends. Who doesn't have friends? I've got like three of them. Like she names them off. And, but all three of her friends, they all live in other cities. So, and what she's telling him is like, yeah, I don't really hang out with these people here at school. I've got these pen pals and we write back and forth. Um, and we have this little trade and, and they're great. Matter of fact, they're so great. I don't really need to hang out with any of you schlubs up here at the school. Um, I mean, she gets hella defensive with a quickness at this point. And Oshikiri, but he recognizes what, what what's happened here is he got his foot in the door, in the conversational door, so to speak. And he's not going to let up. He's going to keep pushing. And he's like, oh, okay, pen pals. That sounds totes legit, right? Um, I guess that means that you and I can't kick it. Uh, like, he's, he's trying. He's trying his hardest. And Satomi so starts to have herself a little pity party at this point. And she's just like, well, probably not. We probably don't need to kick it. Why would you want to hang out with me anyway? I'm boring. Like, I just sit in here and paint by myself. And... In a moment of what I can only describe as pure, suave fuckery, um, Oshikiri not only drops a respectable line for the first time in his life, but also hits her with that reverse psychology. He looks at her like dead ass in in her eyes and the windows to her soul and says, you know, how am I supposed to know if you're boring unless we hang out first? Unless what you're actually, you know, maybe you're just shallow. You don't want to hang out with somebody like me, like, you know, a short guy. And she's like, huh? What? I mean, look, play your power move. Just flip the script on her. Um, and, and it works. Guilt Trip 101, right? Smooth as fuck. She, and she's like, okay, cool. Like, okay, we can hang out. Uh, again, this is this is not going according to plan, but it worked out. Sometimes, like, nerds just get lucky somehow. I don't know. Um, and as they, you know, as they hang out, it, it's awesome, right? Like, they start spending time together after school. They get to know a little each other. Some things are going great. You know, one thing's leading to another. Um, and it's going so great that Oshikiri says, hey, like, why are we kicking it up here at school where the grownups are, you know, we really can't, you know, do some boyfriend and girlfriend stuff up here. Let's go back to your place, which dude's parents aren't home. I don't know why he wasn't like, let's go back to my place. I guess he's trying to go someplace where she feels comfortable. It's a little rapey. Um, but she's just like, um, I don't know if that's a good idea. Uh, if we go to my place, cause, cause my parents are both gone on work trips too. Nobody's home. Um, I don't know who these people are that are leaving their teenage kids alone at home. Without it's Japanese Alfred's 
like butlers running around. Like, where's your where's your butler? Hmm. Um, who does this? Um, but you know, let, let's be honest. These two I teenagers. Mean, Pippi Longstocking was left alone for years. And look what happened to her. I have no idea what happened to her. Uh, yeah, me, <laughs> so, me either. <laughs> and that's the moral of the story, folks. Um, so, but look, these are both. She teenagers. turned out perfectly fine. I'm sure. Did she? I don't know. I, th- there's got to be some like fan fiction where she turns into like a demon slayer. Um, after about 2.5 seconds, both of these teenagers with the raging hormones and everything, they both get really solidly cool with the idea of going to the house with no parental supervision. They they know what's up. So. <laughs> <laughs> they get to the house, and be- but before any shenanigans get started, Satomi, she needs to go check the mail. Like I said, she's got these pen pal friends, and she's she wants her correspondence. So she goes and she gets this letter uh, out of the mailbox, and it's one of, from one of her pen pal friends. And, I mean, apparently there's been some trouble in paradise. Maybe these friendships aren't uh, as as tight as they, they should be because the letter really upsets her. Like, she gets, like, visibly just beside herself. And... She opens up, she's reading it. It's it's basically hate mail. Um, so Tommy tells those security, you know, I don't, I don't know what's wrong with these people. We, we were all such good friends until recently, but it's kind of gone to hell. All three of my people just keep sending me these really rude, hateful letters, and I, I don't get it. And those security's just like, dude, just like, you know, stop opening your mail. Like, you don't deserve to be spoken this way. You ain't got to do, you know, forget these chumps, man. They, fuck them. Um, and so Tommy's, she's obviously upset at this point, though. So security's like, look, all right, I'm going to go. I'm going to let you have your moment. Um, deal with your, you work your stuff out. And so he does, but you know, that Oshikiri, he's forgetful. He, he doesn't, he doesn't pay attention to the details. Sometimes he walks back outside and it's still winter because time hasn't passed to that extent. Um, so he goes back inside and he gets his, his scarf. But as he does, he bumps into homegirl and he knocks a letter out of her hand. And it's a letter that she's written back to, I guess the pen pal. Um, but he gets a glimpse of it. And not only is it, from her address it's to her address like she's sending she's sending this letter to herself um and that's what he comes that's what he comes to realize is that she's she's mailing these hateful letters to herself these friends aren't real this is like there's some sort of psychosis or psychological thing going on uh, that she's invented these people and so he's i mean sounds perfectly normal to me red flag i'm just saying red flags flag on the play like sounds like marriage material there. dude needs to bail (laughs) And so he waits a day or so to kind of confront her because you don't just want to walk up on crazy like that. Um, and so, like, at school, I, like, one or two days later, he goes up and he's just, like, he confronts her about it. He's like, hey, like, I saw the letter. And she does exactly, she she acts exactly the way you think she does. She kind of blows the fuck up. She's been caught in a lie, but she doesn't want to admit it. And, you know, how dare Oshikiri accuse her of something this stupid, this crazy. And she storms off. But when she does, I mean, these kids just can't keep up with their shit. She leaves her painting kit behind. Remember, she's she's a painter. It's kind of who she is. And Oshikiri, he's polite. He's nice. He hadn't given up on this quite yet. He goes to take it back to her house. And when she answers the door, she's not what she looked like at school. She's visibly deranged. She's disheveled she's got these raccoon eyes she kind of looks like she might be fresh out of the exorcist um and all she keeps saying to him like she's looking at him like an insane person and she keeps she's a letter's coming a letter's coming oshakiri a letter's coming and oshakiri kind of has the bedside manner of a caveman and he's like baby girl you're doing this to yourself you crazy bitch you gotta stop um (laughs) And, but, but confronting a person who's having this kind of delusional breakdown, it's kind of like shaking a person you catch sleepwalking. It's not going to end well. Um, you're not supposed to do that. They can react violently. And that's exactly what Ito has her do in this moment. She reacts extremely violent. She grabs his kitchen knife and she just starts plunging this thing into her stomach, man. She just is going at it. She's pin cushioning the shit out of herself. Um, just kills herself right there in front of Oshikiri. Um, and he's like, fuck this. I'm out of here. Like, I didn't sign up for all this. I got to go. I ain't got time for this. And so he beats feet. He takes off. Doesn't go tell anybody. He's not doing anything. And when he gets home, he's having freak out. I mean, like, he's a kid, right? Like, this is not a rational moment for him. Um, he's trying to think about what the proper response to this, you know, suicidal mail fraud should be. Should he call the cops? What should he do? What What if the cops think he killed her? Remember, his, his parents are gone. There's nobody at home. There's no one for him to go to. He's He's once again all alone. He's isolated. So he decides to sleep on it. Like he's he, take take the night, man. So he's you know he's in shock, and so he goes to bed, 
um, you know, not the most logical of decisions, but you know, Hey, I've, I've never personally been in that situation. So who am I to judge? Uh, so he goes to sleep, but in the middle of the night, something wakes him up. He hears something. He swears he heard somebody walking through the house and he's there by himself. This is you know, like, what's up. So he gets up to go check it out and he goes to the bathroom and he looks over and in the bathroom, they've kind of got this wooden vanity table. Um, and on this wooden vanity table, he sees a piece of paper that's been like pinned to the table with a screwdriver. Like somebody used a screwdriver to like nail it to the table. And I mean, somebody just stabbed this thing to the surface and he realizes that it's a letter and he goes up and he starts to read it, read it and no idea who left this thing there. And the letter, like it says, you murderer, you, you killed my friend Satomi. You stabbed her, you stabbed her over and over again, but you left proof. You motherfucker. You, like, isn't your neck cold? Where's your scarf? And he's, he's like, Oh shit. Like my, I left my scarf at Satomi's house with this dead body. And so as he, but, but then he kind of looks at the letter again and he looks at who it's signed and it's his initials. It's his own initials. And as he looks at the letter again, it's in his handwriting. Um, and, and Junji Ito's, he ends this story with Oshikiri just breaking out to this kind of cold sweat and he's staring at the letter and he stares at the screwdriver and then it just goes black. And so what, what is it? Is this a ghost story? Is this a possession story? Um, it, it's one of those things that Junji Ito does so well where he plays with your expectations of what might have happened. Uh, you're looking at like the different levels of, of just terror. Um, and is, is terror in and of itself um, communicable? Um, is, is this disease, this insanity, can it be passed from one person to the another? Uh, how does, how does our trauma affect the people that we hang out with? I mean, there, you can go deep into this thing as you can with most Juji Ito stories. There's a lot of psychology involved with this. Yeah. Um, I mean, you said Japanese master of horror. He is a master oh, of horror for any culture. Yeah. Just the way that he does his pacing and, and it's almost poetic because all of his stories tend to have a turn at the end of it. Like, you know, you, you look at song or I, I'm, bad English major, but you look at sonnets or whatever, and they, they go a certain way. They're a love sonnet up until the last two lines, and then they go in a different direction. There, there's a turn there, and that's what he does with a lot of his stories. Um, if you read enough of his stuff, I will say that it gets formulaic. It, it does, but he's not trying to do anything that he's not trying to do, I, I guess, is is one of the things. Um, it's absolutely Junji Ito art that you know and expect. Uh, it, it's that when it comes to the people, they're very clean but the backgrounds are heavily textured. It's that thin line. Everything mm -hmm. is everything is detailed to the perfect width. He's meticulous, meticulous in the way he lays these things out. And when you play that with the way he paces the story, with the, the terrific mind games that he plays, like, I mean, he's the only man I know who can take a story about two cats and turn it into a horror story um, and have it be genuinely terrific. So uh, it's <laughs> okay to be formulaic if your formula works. Mm-hmm. And, and it does, does for him. Yeah. Um, now, I will say that this, as far as the short story collection goes, it's not my favorite Junji Ito work. It's done. It's yeah. it's not I Uzumaki. I didn't read all of them. I started um, to, and I just kind of... There's a few of them I haven't read. I try to catch up on most of his stuff, because as I try to break into some manga, which I, I do, I, I love the form, the, the medium of comics, and that's all manga is. It's, yeah. it's just comics. It's words and pictures juxtaposed. There's the people story. that are, you know... Yeah. Shooting the internet right now. Oh, fuck them. They'll be all right. Um, <laughs> the, the, they'll be fine. But that's, that's all it is. It's just a way to tell stories. And so, unfortunately, be, when it comes to manga, a lot of the stuff that we get is through, it's kind of monopolized. It's it's, it's uh, through shonen. Yeah. through and, 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 and not stepping in. If this is your cup of tea, you're back. I mean, dude, I read capes and tight stories all day yeah, long. It's but just a different place to get your capes and tight stories. So. A lot of it's in, infantilized, though. A lot of it's it's for a very young audience, and that's great for that young audience. Uh, for the most part, I'm not part of that young audience, so I try to find manga that's more uh, centered towards my, my taste, my gears. Mm -hmm. uh, and Junji Ito fits that, man. He fits it to a T. Uh, he's done some great work. Um, and this is, this is no different. Um, again, like I said, not my favorite thing that he's read, but... As far as the way he lays out the story and the way he lays out these short stories and then he connects them uh, into an overall narrative, kind of like a little Frankenstein's monster mm -hmm. of short stories. I think it's brilliant. Yeah. I think he's one of the most brilliant minds making comics today. <clears throat> yeah, he's just, really, really good. Just yeah. solid as shit. Yeah, the art's always good. The stories are always solid. <clears throat> um, you know, I enjoy, I've got probably two more books of his to read sitting mm -hmm. at home. I did not read the short stories out of the Frankenstein. Book. To me, read, that's the best part. I read the Frankenstein and I liked it. Yeah. Um, it was a, it was a cool take on Frankenstein. Very uh, loose adaptation, but yeah, I mean, it, yeah. the, the bones are there. Yeah. 
Um, I read, I think I started to read the first short story and then I got into something else and just never went back to it. So you should, you should, you should revisit no, it. I, I um, will. It's, it, I did not move it to my finish pile. It's still yeah. in my to read pile. So the, his short stories are, I mean that to me, that's his bread and butter. So I think that's what he does best, uh, in, in a way that not too many people can do. Well, you uh, know, uh, relating it to an artist I'm familiar with Stephen King's much better at short stories than he, he is. Novels. Is. Yeah, he is. So. And I, I think you got to know your strengths. And I think yeah. he absolutely, I mean, Stephen King, his strength is his bank account, but, um, <laughs> so, uh, his strength is a large fandom. Yeah, well, that too. That's been um, following him for years and a well of creativity. Yeah. Uh, so that's my man. Like I said, yeah, check awesome, out man. check out the Frankenstein anthology if you haven't. You can order it at your local comic shop and get it for you. It's worth putting on yourself. It's 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 a quick read. Um, you can you know if you have an hour, you can knock the thing out of the park. So uh, let's see where are we at? I forgot where I was at. Oh, we're at the comic shop. Okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I started talking about manga and just completely forgot what we were doing. I thought we were just sitting here having a conversation, not recording a podcast. Um, so we ready to kind of wrap this thing up, guys? Yeah. All right, cool. Well, the way uh, on this podcast, the way we like to end this thing is to kind of look forward to next Wednesday. We all set the menu. Woo, see you next week. Oh, damn. No, sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> the, the, the Jeopardy buzzer. Um, <laughs> look forward to next Wednesday, man, because next Wednesday is when the new comics come out. That's when we get the, the <clears> next uh, our next fix, so to speak, of our little addiction that we have here with sequential art. Uh, and so we like to give you guys an idea or a suggestion, so to speak, of uh, if you're listening at home, of what you might want to pick up. And we have zero idea. We haven't we haven't gotten comp copies of these. We haven't read them yet. So we have no idea if they are going to be any good or not. But kind of hedging our bets uh, and they look cool. They sound cool. So go check out any one of these three or four comics that we're about to drop on you uh, this next week. It's going to be good. I only have one. So if any of y'all have two, you get the have bonus. One. You get the bonus this week. You feel like a rule breaker, Matt? How much, how much chaos do you want in your life? Always. Well, why don't you tell us what we should be picking up this next week? So I'm hedging my bets that Batman number 86 is going to be something that needs to be read. This has got a new creative team. <clears throat> James Tinian the fourth, Tony Daniel, and Danny Mickey. Um, the synopsis is it's a new day in Gotham City, but not the same old Batman with Bane vanquished. And one of his longtime allies gone, Batman has to start picking up the pieces and stepping up his game. Batman has a new plan for Gotham City, but he's not the only one. Deathstroke has returned as well under a mysterious new contract that could change everything. Huh. Man, I love seeing some Batman versus Deathstroke, man. Oh, yeah. I, I'm, th- I'm stoked about this starting Me off too. this way. I'm, I'm really I'm happy to see Tinian. Is, is being the one that's taken over this book. You He's read, been groomed for a long time to take over Batman. Did you so. read his detective stuff? No, I, oh, I, man. I started, whenever he got on Detective, I started it, but Detective started off as a uh, team book. Yeah. And I am not all about some Batman team books. That's, that's fair. So I dropped off. That's fair. Quick. It, it was good. Um, I loved his Batman Forever stuff he mm-hmm. did. He, he's been being groomed for a long time to take over the Batman titles. Yeah. So. Glad to see he finally gets that up. I'm stoked. You and me both. So, there's an artist I've been missing for a while. Who that? Matt Hawkins. Oh yeah. Yeah, you know he has not published a new story in a minute. He start the last new one that I remember him doing was Postal. Did mm-hmm. you know? You might remember him from Postal and Tithe and some other books, but he's got a new book coming out next week. Clock number one. Of course, it's Image Comics because that's where he lives. Yeah. Um, Matt Hawkins and Colleen Duran. Ooh. Yeah. Within three weeks, hundreds of millions of healthy people worldwide contract uh, various forms of aggressive cancer, and the proliferation, seemingly a viral outbreak, stumps the best scientific minds available. But after a leading cancer researcher researcher loses his wife and watches his nine-year-old daughter begin to succumb to the same illness, he must race against the clock to end a global conspiracy that can propel the world straight into World War III or worse. I didn't hear about this book, and yeah. now I'm sad because I didn't pre-order this. Yeah, hopefully Matt will order a couple of them here for the store. Um, I love anything Matt Hawkins does, uh-huh. uh, from his Aphrodite stuff to, yeah, I mean, everything. He, he's He was one of the original creators that went to Image. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he's a Top Cow guy. Yeah, he and he runs the Top Cow end of it now. Um, 
just about everything this guy does, mind management, about everything he's involved in is a good story. His essays, just his yeah. essays on the comics industry in general he, are brilliant. He may legit be one of the smartest people in comic books, like from an intelligence standpoint. Well, yeah, he was. He's a I, physicist. Yeah, I was going to say his yeah. degree is in, like he's a, and he's not just like a, I went and took some physics and got my bachelor's degree. Like no, he got yeah, his, he's, he does, I think he has a master's. I believe in, so. In physics. Yeah, he, he's, he's brilliant and it physics? shows through <laughs> Shows through in his writing. Um, and dude, Colleen is clean, like beautiful art. Oh I my. actually, yeah, I talked to Matt. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off oh, about good. Colleen. I talked to Matt a few years ago at a uh, convention, mm-hmm. and he had hinted at that point that all of his worlds were tied together. Yeah. And then shortly after that, we got the fall of Eden where you tied tithes and postal mm-hmm. and uh, mind management into it. So, um, It'll be interesting to see if this ties into that. And like you said, Colleen uh, Doran's just, uh, you know. Uh, crisp. Yeah. Crisp, so, crisp lines. So very uh, interested to see this book. Lovely. Like lovely is a word that I would use for Colleen. Her yeah. work is lovely. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to go with a book, uh, and this is going to be kind of a bigger book. It's not a floppy. This is an original graphic novel. This is OGN. It's called Go With The Flow, and it's published by First Seconds. Uh, are you all familiar with First Second as a publisher? They... They're they're not quite fanographics. They're kind of in that vein. Uh, they 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 take some artists that you probably haven't heard of, and they I mean they're producing more of the OGN type stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, but go with the flow is written by Karen Schneeman and uh, drawn by Lily Williams. And this story is comical. And I come out the bat saying the story was not written for me, but I think I'm going to enjoy the shit out of it anyway. Um, <laughs> when four best friends notice that the boys that had, look, they're at school, the boys have a brand new football uh, stadium and uniforms and they're all crisp and clean. And the girls, man, the girls can't even get, like they can't even get feminine hygiene products in the bathroom. Um, and so they decide to take matters into their own hands. They, they petition, they write letters, they make noise, and eventually maybe even go a little too far um, trying to get, things like feminine hygiene products, put in the bathroom, books called Go With The Flow, you connect the dots for yourself. Uh, I'm about it, about it. I think this is going to be hilarious. I think, I like, yeah, this is going to be funny as shit. So I cannot wait. Uh, go check this book out. I would say that is definitely out of your wheelhouse. For, I mean, not necessarily, but, though. Like, I love books like Man yeah, Eaters. Um, I, think, I think that's great. I'm, I'm down with some feminist agenda. I'm not saying raise that. My fist. I'm not saying that at all. I'm just, you know. I mean, I'm not having a period anytime soon. Yeah. So, like, maybe not. Who knows? Way to represent. You right. can't question tomorrow. <laughs> so, <laughs> we were, on that note, <laughs> we're ready to bring this thing all the way home. Yeah. Uh, well, right, let's ahead. end it on a period. Yeah. Just, just <laughs> go ahead and tune in next week for an update on that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. Um, all right. Well, we've mentioned it before. We really hope you guys come and hang out with us on our Facebook page. It's on and popping. There's lots of things happening. We're posting uh, books, pictures. They're talking about TV shows. The kind of broader, expansive nerd culture. Uh, if you want some more of that, that's where you go. We keep a good, watchful eye on it. We try to make things, make sure things don't get too hot, uh, too heavy. Keep people in check when they need to be put in check. It's a fun, positive place. We want to keep it that way. So come join us there. Cost you zero dollars uh, just to come be friends. That's all we want. It's friends. Um, if you want to see images of some of the panels and books and stuff that we're reading, uh, you should check out our Instagram page and or our Twitter page. Uh, depending on which day of the week it is, depends on which one of those gets posted on. Um, we're at SFG Podcast on both of those. If you want to write us an email, maybe maybe you don't want to hear me talk about the tampon book, um, go ahead and just fire off an email <laughs> over to southernfriedgeekery at gmail.com to let us know how you feel about it. You know, what, you know No strings attached, <coughs> so to speak. Um, just, Gross. <laughs> um, you fire off an email, guys. We would love to hear from you. Um, you know, we're always interested in what you're interested in. Uh, we're always interested in your feedback. And speaking of feedback, one last little favor you can do us, uh, or two last little favors. Number one, if you listen to us on iTunes, go drop us a rating and review. It really does help. Let's people know that we're a quality podcast worth listening to or we're not, depending on how you feel about the situation. Um, or the second thing you can do is go find that link, man, and tell us what your favorite stuff of 2019 was. Let us know. We, we genuinely want to know your opinion. We genuinely care because it helps us find new books. It helps us know what we need to be talking about. Um, we, it's, it's your way to sit in the proverbial fourth chair. Uh, for a little bit. And and we want that. We want your input. We care about the community that we're creating. So with all that in mind, all of that, we will see you guys here at the same time, same place next week. We love you. We miss you. We'll talk to you soon. Go forth. Love some comics. Woo! Jerry Woo. We see, we've got to give Jerry credit for the woo. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's the Jerry Woo. Yeah. It's good Jerry Woo, Craig. Thanks.
I mean, I could let it die, but you guys don't let me. No, the Jerry Wu lives forever.